Wuthering Heights. Chapter 8 On the morning of a fine June day, my first bonny little nursling, and the last of the ancient Earnshaw stock, was born. We were busy with the egg in a far away field, when the girl that usually brought our breakfast came running an hour too soon across the meadow and up the lane, calling me as she ran. Oh, such a grand bairn, she panted out, the finest lad that ever breathed, but doctor says Mrs must go. He says she's been in consumption these many months. I heard him tell Miss Indley, and now she has nothing to keep her, and she'll be dead before winter. You must come home directly. You're to nurse it, Nelly, to feed it with sugar and milk, and take care of it day and night. I wish I were you, because it'll be all yours when there's no missus. But is she very ill? I asked, flinging down my rake and tying me bonnet. I guess she is. She looks bravely, replied the girl. And she talks as if she thought of living to see it grow a man. She's out of her head for joy. It's such a beauty. If I were her, I'm certain I should not die. I should get better at the bare sight of it, in spite of Kenneth. I was fairly mad at him. Dame Archer brought the cherub down to Master in the house, and his face just began to light up when the old croaker steps forward and he says, "'He, Earnshaw, it's a blessing your wife has been spared to leave you this son. When she came, I felt convinced we shouldn't keep her long. And now I must tell you, the winter will probably finish her. Don't take on and fret about it too much. It can't be helped. And besides, you should have known better than to choose such a rush of a lass.' "'And what did the master answer?' I inquired. "'I think he swore, but I didn't mind him. "'I was straining to see the bairn.' "'And she began again to describe it rapturously. "'I, as zealous as herself, hurried eagerly home to admire on my part, "'though I was very sad for Inley's sake. "'He had room in his heart only for two idols, his wife and himself. "'He doted on both, and adorned one, and I couldn't conceive how he would bear the loss. When we got to Wuthering Heights, there he stood at the front door, and as I passed in, I asked, how was the baby? Nearly ready to run about, Nell, he replied, putting on a cheerful smile. And the mistress? I ventured to inquire. The doctor says she's... Damn the doctor, he interrupted, reddening. Francis is quite right. She'll be perfectly well by the time next week. Are you going upstairs? Will you tell her that I'll come if she'll promise not to talk? I left her because she wouldn't hold her tongue, and she must. Tell her Mr Kenneth says she must be quiet. I delivered this message to Mrs Earnshaw. She seemed in flighty spirits, and replied merrily. I hardly spoke a word, Ellen, and there he's gone out twice, crying. Well, I say I promise I won't speak, but that doesn't bind me to not laugh at him. Poor soul, till within a week of her death, that gay heart never failed her, and her husband persisted doggedly, nay, furiously, in affirming her health improved every day. When Kenneth warned him that his medicines were useless at that stage of the malady, and he needn't put him to further expense by attending her, he retorted, I know you need not, she's well, she doesn't want any more attendance from you, she never was in a consumption, it was a fever. And it's gone. Her pulse is as slow as mine now, and her cheek is cool. He told his wife the same story, and she seemed to believe him. But one night, while leaning on his shoulder, in the act of saying she thought she'd be able to get up tomorrow, a fit of coughing took her, a very slight one. He raised her in his arms. She put her two hands about his neck. Her face changed, and she was dead. As the girl had anticipated, the child ate and fell wholly into my hands. Mr Earnshaw, provided he saw him healthy, and never heard him cry, but was contented as far as regarded him. For himself, he grew desperate. His sorrow was of that kind that will not lament. He neither wept nor prayed. He cursed and defied, execrated God and man, and gave himself up to reckless dissipation. The servants couldn't bear his tyrannical and evil conduct long, Joseph and I were the only two that would stay. I had not the heart to leave my charge, and besides, you know, I had been his foster sister, 
and excused his behaviour more readily than a stranger would. Joseph remained to Hector over tenants and labourers, and because it was his vocation to be where he had plenty of wickedness to reprove. The master's bad ways and bad companions formed a pretty example for Catherine and Heathcliff. His treatment at the latter was enough to make a fiend of a saint, and truly it appeared as if the lad were possessed of something diabolical at that period. He delighted to witness Hindley degrading himself past redemption, and became daily more notable for savage sullenness and ferocity. I could not half tell what an infernal house we had. The curate dropped calling, and nobody decent came near us, at last until Edgar Linton's visits to Miss Cathy might be an exception. At fifteen, she was the queen of the countryside. She had no peer, and she did turn out a haughty, headstrong creature. I own I did not like her after her infancy was past, and I vexed her frequently by trying to bring down her arrogance. She never took an aversion to me. She had a wondrous constancy to old attachments. Even Heathcliff kept his hold on her, and her affections unalterably, and young Linton, with all his superiority, found it difficult to make an equally deep impression. He was my late master. That's his portrait over at Flower Place. He used to hang on one side, and his wife's on the other, but hers had been removed, or else you might see something of what she was. Can you make that out? Mrs. Dean raised the candle, and I discerned a soft-featured face, exceedingly resembling the young lady at the heights, but more pensive and amiable in expression. It formed a sweet picture. The long, light hair curled slightly on the temples. The eyes were large and serious, the figure almost too graceful. I did not marvel how Catherine Earnshaw could forget her first friend for such an individual. I marvelled much how he, with a mind to correspond with this person, could fancy my idea of Catherine Earnshaw. A very agreeable portrait, I observed to the housekeeper. Is it like? Yes, she answered. But he looked better when he was animated. That's his everyday countenance. He wanted spirit in general. Catherine had kept up her acquaintance with Dillington since her five weeks' residence among them, and as she had no temptation to show her rough side in their company, Anne had the sense to be ashamed of being rude. Where she experienced such invariable courtesy, she imposed unwittingly on the old lady and gentleman by her ingenious cordiality, gained the admiration of Isabella and the heart and soul of her brother. Acquisitions that flattered her from the first, for she was full of ambition, and led her to adopt a double character without exactly intending to deceive anyone. In the place where she heard Heathcliff termed a vulgar young ruffian and worse than a brute, she took care not to act like him, but at home she had small inclination to practice politeness that would only be laughed at and restrain an unruly nature when it would bring her neither credit nor praise. Mr. Edgar seldom mustered courage to visit Woodbury Nights openly. He had a terror of Earnshaw's reputation, and shrunk from encountering him, and yet he was always received with our best attempts at civility. The master himself avoided offending him, knowing why he came, and if he could not be gracious, he kept out of way. I rather think his appearance there was distasteful to Catherine, she was not heartful, nor played a coquette, and had evidently an objection to her two friends meeting at all, for when Heathcliff expressed contempt of Linton in his presence, she couldn't half go inside, and she did in his presence, and then Linton evinced disgust and antipathy to Heathcliff. She dared not treat his sentiments with indifference, as if depreciation of her playmate were of scarcely any consequence to her. I've had many a laugh at her perplexities and untold troubles, which she vainly strove to hide from my mockery. That sounds ill-natured, but she was so proud, it became really impossible to pity her distresses, till she should be chastened into more humility. She did bring herself finally to confess and to confide in me, but there was not a soul else that she might fashion into an adviser. Mr. Hindley had gone up from home one afternoon, and Heathcliff presumed to give himself holiday on strength of it. He reached the age of sixteen then, I think, and without having bad features or being deficient in intellect, 
he contrived to convey an impression of inward and outward repulsiveness that his present aspect retains no traces of. In the first place, he had by that time lost the benefit of his early education. Continual hard work began soon and concluded late, and extinguished any curiosity he once possessed in pursuit of knowledge, and any love for books or learning. His childhood sense of superiority, instilled into him by the favours of old Mrs Earnshaw, was faded away. He struggled long to keep up an equally inequality with Catherine in her studies, and yielded with poignant though silent regret. But he yielded completely, and there was no prevailing on him to take a step in the way of moving forward, when he found he must unnecessarily sink beneath his former level. Then personal appearance sympathised with mental deterioration, he acquired a slouching gait and ignoble look. His naturally reserved disposition was exaggerated into an almost idiotic excess of unsociable moroseness, and he took a grim pleasure, apparently, in exciting the aversion rather than the esteem of his few acquaintances. Catherine and he were constant companions, still at his seasons of respite from labour, but he had ceased to express his fondness for her in words, and recoiled with angry suspicion from her girlish caresses, as if conscious there would be no gratification in lavishing such marks of affection on him. On the before-named occasion he came into the house to announce his intention of doing nothing, while I was assisting Miss Cathy to arrange her dress. She had not reckoned on him taking it into his head to be idle, and imagining she would have the whole place to herself, she managed, by some means, to inform Mr Edgar of her brother's absence, and then was preparing to receive him. "'Cathy, are you busy this afternoon?' asked Heathcliff. "'Are you going anywhere?' "'No, it's raining,' she answered. "'Why have you that silk frock on, then?' he said. "'Nobody coming here, I hope.' "'Not that I know of,' stammered Miss. "'But you should be in the field now, Heathcliff. "'It's an hour past dinner time. I thought you were gone.' "'Inley does not often free us from his accursed presence,' observed the boy. "'I'll not work any more today. I'll stay with you.' "'Oh, but Joseph will tell,' she suggested. "'You'd better go.' "'Joseph is loading lime on the further side of Peniston Crags. "'It'll take him till dark, and he'll never know.' "'So saying, he lounged to the fire and sat down. "'Catherine reflected an instant, with knitted brows. "'She found it needful to smooth the way for an intrusion. "'Isabella and Edgar Linton talked of calling this afternoon,' she said, "'at the conclusion of a minute's silence. "'As it rains, I hardly expect them, but they may come, "'and if they do, you run the risk of being scolded for no good.' "'Order Ellen to say you're engaged, Cathy,' he persisted. "'Don't turn me out for those pitiful silly friends of yours. "'I'm on the point sometimes of complaining that they... "'But I'll not.' "'That they what?' cried Catherine, "'gazing at him with a troubled countenance. "'Oh, Nelly,' she added petulantly, "'jerking her head away from her hands.' You've combed my hair quite out of curl. That's enough. Let me alone. What, what are you on the point of complaining about, Heathcliff? Nothing. Only look at the almanac on that wall. He pointed to a framed sheet hanging near the window and continued. The crosses are for the evenings you've spent with the Lintons. The dots are those spent with me. Do you see? I've marked every day. Yes. Very foolish, as if I took notice replied Catherine in a peevish tone. And where's the sense of that? To show that I do take notice, said Heathcliff. And should I always be sitting with you? She demanded, growing more irritated. What good do I get? What do you talk about? You might be dumb or a baby for anything you say to amuse me or for anything you do either. You never told me that before I talk too little or that you dislike my company, Cathy exclaimed Heathcliff, in much agitation. "'It's no company at all when people know nothing and say nothing,' she muttered. Her companion rose up, but he hadn't time to express his feelings further, for a horse's feet were heard on the flags, and having knocked gently, young Linton entered, his face brilliant with delight at the unexpected summons he had received. Doubtless Catherine marked the difference between her friends as one came in and the other went out.' The contrast resembled what you see in exchanging a bleak, hilly coal country for a beautiful, fertile valley. 
and his voice and greeting were as opposite as his aspect. He had a sweet, low manner of speaking, and pronounced his words as you do. That's less gruff than we talk here, and softer. I'm not come too soon, am I? he said, casting a look at me. I began to wipe the plate, and tidy some drawers at the far end in the dresser. No, answered Catherine. What are you doing there, Nelly? My work, miss, I replied. Mr. Rindley had given me directions to make a third party in any private visits Linton chose to pay. She stepped behind me and whispered crossly, Take yourself and your dusters off. When company are in the house, servants don't commence scouring and cleaning the room where there are. It's a good opportunity now the master's away, I answered aloud. He hates me to be fidgeting over these things in his presence. I'm sure Mr. Edgar will excuse me. I hate you to be fidgeting in my presence, exclaimed the young lady imperiously, not allowing her guest time to speak. She'd failed to recover her equanimity since a little dispute with Heathcliff. I'm sorry for it, Miss Catherine, was my response, and I proceeded assiduously with my occupation. She, supposing Edgar could not see her, snatched the cloth from me hand and pinched me with a prolonged wrench, very spitefully on the arm. I've said I did not love her, and rather relish mortifying her vanity now and then. Besides, she hurt me extremely. So I started up from my knees and screamed out, Oh, miss, that's a nasty trick. You've no right to nip me. I'm not going to bear it. I didn't crunch you, you lying creature, cried she, her fingers tingling to repeat the act, and her ears red with rage. She never had power to conceal her passion. It always set her old complexion in a blaze. What's that, then? I retorted, showing a decided purple witness to refute her. She stamped her foot, wavered a moment, and then irresistibly impelled by the naughty spirit within her, slapped me on the cheek, a stinging blow that filled both eyes with water. Catherine, love, Catherine, interposed Linton, greatly shocked at the double fault of falsehood and violence which his idol had committed. Leave the room, Ellen, she repeated, trembling all over. Little Ayrton, who followed me everywhere, and was sitting near me on the floor, at seeing my tears commenced crying himself, and sobbed out complaints against wicked Aunt Cathy, which drew her fury onto his unlucky head. She seized his shoulders and shook him till the poor child waxed livid, and Edgar thoughtlessly laid hold of her hands to deliver him. In an instant one was wrung free, and the astonished young man felt it applied over his own ear in a way that could not be mistaken for jest. He drew back in consternation. I lifted Ayrton in my arms and walked off to the kitchen with him, leaving the door of communication open, for I was curious to watch how they settled their disagreement. The insulted visitor moved to the spot where he'd laid his hat, pale with a quivering lip. That's right, I said to myself. Take warning and be gone. It's a kindness to let you have a glimpse of her genuine disposition. Where are you going? demanded Catherine, advancing to the door. He swerved aside and attempted to pass. You must not go, she replied energetically. I must and shall, he replied in a subdued voice. No, she persisted, grabbing the handle. Not yet, Edgar Linton. Sit down. You shall not leave me in that temper. I should be miserable all night, and I won't be miserable for you. Can I stay after you've struck me? asked Linton. Catherine was mute. You've made me afraid and ashamed of you, he continued. I'll not come here again. Her eyes began to glisten, and then her lids to twinkle. And you told a deliberate untruth, he said. I didn't, she cried, recovering her speech. I did nothing deliberately. Well, go if you please. Get away and now I'll cry. I'll cry myself sick. She dropped down on her knees by a chair and set to weeping in serious earnest. Edgar persevered in his resolution as far as the court. There he lingered and I resolved to encourage him. Mrs. Dreadfully wayward, sir, I called out. As bad as any married child, you'd better be riding home, or else she'll be sick, only to grieve us. The soft thing looked askance through the window. He possessed the power to depart as much as a cat possesses the power to leave a mouse half killed, or a bird half eaten. Ah, I thought, there'll be no saving him, he's doomed, and flies to his fate. And so it was. 
He turned abruptly, hastened into the house again, shut the door behind him, and when I went in a while, after to inform them that Earnshaw had come on rapid drunk, ready to pull the whole place about our ears, his ordinary frame of mind in that condition, I saw that Quarrel had merely effected a closer intimacy, had broken the outworks of youthful timidity, enabled them to forsake the disguise of friendship and confess themselves lovers. Intelligence of Mr. Inley's arrival drove Linton speedily to his horse and Catherine to her chamber. I went to hide little Ayrton and to take the shot out of the master's fowling piece which he was fond of playing with his insane excitement to the hazard of any lives who he provoked or even attracted his notice too much. And I did upon the plan of removing it that he might do less mischief if he did go to the length of firing the gun. <laughs>